Hey guys, and welcome to the first video in our Module 3 lecture series. Our topic of discussion this week is based on Chapter 4 from the Haywood text, and it is early motor development, which is basically encompassing the movements that we observe in infancy. So how do infants move? There's a lot of development that happens between birth to one year, and so it's really helpful for us to kind of break infancy down into stages. From our newborn to our early infancy period, which is about six months, most of the movements we observe are spontaneous movements as well as infantile reflexes. From our early infancy towards the late infancy period, so about six months to about a year, we start to see a more gradual development of voluntary movements or goal-directed behaviors. And uh, we start to identify different motor milestones that are building up to bigger skills that we end up developing kind of later in our toddler uh, aged period into early childhood and then off into adolescence and adulthood. So the topics that we cover this week Part one is more interested in our spontaneous and reflexive movements. So there's going to be a greater emphasis on uh, ages that are like earlier in infancy. And then our second part of our module lectures are going to be more focused on motor milestones, which although we have some motor milestones that happen earlier in infancy, most of these are going to more gradually develop later in the infancy period. Most of the movements, again, that we see throughout infancy or in the, the beginning stages of infancy are spontaneous movements and infantile reflexes. Now, babies don't usually tend to initiate movement with a lot of purpose or specific goals, right? Um, because they haven't really interacted with their environment, objects in their environment, people in their environment very much. So spontaneous movements are going to describe movements that occur without any apparent stimulation. We might identify these or observe these as squirming, leg thrust, stretching, and clenching fingers and toes. All of these movements can be described as being nonspecific, right? so they're not um, oriented towards performing a specific task, they're not goal-oriented, um, and then the movements are also generalized, so they're not uh, kind of local to um, a specific direction. They're not localized to a, one specific muscle. Spontaneous movements have a lot of variability in them. So from one observation to the next, while we may be able to classify certain spontaneous movements in a singular category, there's a lot of variability of movements within that category. If you lay a baby down in a supine position, you are likely to observe what is known as supine kicking or spontaneous thrusting of the legs. Now, this can occur as a single leg kicking. It can occur as both legs kicking. Um, in, this, in the cases where both legs are moving at the same time, they might be uh, moving simultaneously or like kicking in a symmetrical fashion. They might be alternating kicks. Uh, so there's a high degree of variability in how you might observe these kicking movements. But an interesting thing that was found by uh, Thelen and her colleagues in the 1980s is that although these movements are random, there is a coordinated movement pattern. Um, and it's carried out by co-contraction of flexor and extensor muscles at the hip, knee, and ankle. So if we bring our attention to the figure over here, if we break our kick into um, kind of a flexion and extension phase, when we bring the leg into the body or when the infant brings the leg into the body, it was noticed that there was a co-contraction of the hip flexors to flex the hip and the knee flexors to flex the knee. We also do get some ankle dorsiflexion, right? And that provides kind of this uh, unison movement of all of our joints moving at the same time. We then get the extension phase where the hip extensors are working to extend the hip 
knee extensors are working to extend the knee, and then sometimes you might also get some toe pointing or plantar flexion at the level of the ankle. It is speculated that supine kicking might be a precursor to walking. Now, although spontaneous movements are not goal-oriented or goal-directed in any way, we do see some similarities between the movements in kicking as compared to walking. So if we use this little man up here, right, as we go into a swing phase of gait, we flex at our hip, we flex at our knee, we flex or dorsiflex at our ankle. That's followed by knee extension, hip extension, and then ankle plantar flexion as we propulse ourselves forward. Similar to our kicking, right? There's a flexion stage and an extension stage. So the differences between our supine kicking and walking are that the supine kicking motions happen in unison, meaning all of our joints move at one time and not independent from one another. And in walking, it's more of a sequential flexion and extension um, that occurs from joint to joint. But it's still kind of an interesting concept to think about that these spontaneous movements might be preparing us for later movements that we perform more voluntarily in infancy. Spontaneous movements can also occur with the arms. Now, although these movements are not as rhythmical or repetitious as kicking, we do see similar coordination patterns um, in extension of the elbow, wrist, and fingers. Also similar to the legs, the arm usually moves as a whole unit, right? So um, if we flex the arm in or extend the arm out or wave it around, right, it's generally moving, all the joints are moving together. Um, and not independent of one another. So it's very rare that you would see a baby wave its fingers at you or just move its wrist or just like move its elbows, okay? So if we have a true spontaneous movement, there's going to kind of be this unison idea um, between each of the levels of the joints. Spontaneous arm movements are thought to be precursors to reaching and grasping movements, which generally makes sense. And similar to the legs, there is a gradual progression um, into sequential movements. So we start with this spont spontaneity concept, and then as we get more experience with engagement with different tasks and environmental constraints, our individual constraints are changing, we are able to produce sequential muscle activation patterns so that we can have more voluntary movements of the arms. The other type of movements that we commonly see throughout infancy are infantile reflexes. So these are stereotypical responses that occur after the presence of a certain stimulus. They only happen during infancy. So we do have other reflexes such as blinking, stretch reflexes, withdraw reflexes that typically persist throughout the lifespan because they're serving as some type of protective mechanism for the body and its tissues. But the general concept of a reflex being a stimulus and response relationship is still the same. Um, so we're involving a single muscle or muscle group throughout the reflex arc. Right? We get a stimulus that's picked up by a sensory organ. There's an afferent signal sent to the spinal cord and then an efferent signal sent out to an agonist muscle so that we can create movement. Now, um, there are three categories or types of infantile reflexes. They are primitive, postural, and locomotor. In the coming slides, you'll kind of see that some of these reflexes only occur when the body is in a certain orientation or position. Some of the reflexes will appear and disappear at different stages of infancy. Some of them have to disappear in order for others to appear. Um, and that kind of leads into this idea that there is a timeline or a relative timeline of when we would expect to uh, see certain reflexes in infants. So warning signs of atypical development might be signaled when um, a, a reflex doesn't uh, show up at all, 
so absence of a reflex. Sometimes atypical development could be signaled by the persistence of a reflex. So in other words, let's say we have a startle reflex and it never goes away, right? Um, and then lastly, some of our reflexes are symmetrical. Um, so if we end up with asymmetrical responses in the reflex, that might indicate there could be some atypical development going on one side of the body. These three types of reflexes will go more in depth of certain examples of those reflexes and then how they are distinguished from one another in the next video.